Da, 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 da. Oh, but, okay, so one of the things I wanted to talk to you about mm. it is at the core of my interest in art uh, is portraiture is a big part of what I'm interested in art. And that's why, you know, ultimately I want to build a theater company. That's the long-term goal. And because it's human interaction, it's, it's what we do as humans and, you know, the way that we create culture, the way that we create traditions that interests me the most. But sort of at the core of that is this idea of portraiture, right? So I know that you have done a lot of modeling. And one of the things I think is that models don't get enough credit in the artistic process. Mm. Well, there's various levels of room for that with various photographers. You know, not every photographer is looking for a collaboration. Mm -hmm. You know, some are just mm -hmm. looking for you to present an image to get a point across. Other photographers who also do fine art photography then sometimes are more open to have the models participate in the story. So, mm -hmm. yes, but it's not always the same. But I like that it is that way for you. It's that way on your website, at least, and show it as the core of your, you know, interests moving forward on your two-year path. Is that part of the two-year path? Starting well, with portraiture and ending with a theater company? Well, so I have my goal, it, the path is, uh, it's a little longer than that, but portraiture is a part of the process for sure and you know it's a way of interacting with people and finding talent hmm. you know it's like well modeling's not easy no it's a, yeah you don't get a lot of credit for the fact that like you are sometimes trying to like balance on the edge of a hard rock and the ocean and it's not comfortable but you have to make it look comfortable for long enough to get the shot and, mm -hmm. and it can be cold and yeah. Um, yeah. For sure. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. Models go through a lot to get the shot. Yeah. There's also the time. We have to take the time out to do it. And whether there's makeup, whether there's hair, whether it's costuming, you know, it's a whole process. Exactly. And, but even beyond that, <coughs> even beyond that, I think that there's something that is magical about that interaction between the two creatives who, because I see it not as an artist and a model, I see it as two creatives who are involved in a project. And when that creative chemistry starts to melt, there's something magical that happens that both people are responsible for. Mm -hmm. And uh, Well, and I, I don't necessarily call myself a model. Like, I model, but I... I know you don't, I but have, that's what I'm talking about. But see, I, I do like the idea of being two creatives, and that's sort of how I, how I explain it to people when they ask me about the photos that I do and take, is that it's more of a creative process, yeah. you know, than just, like, put on this swimsuit and, you know. Actually, I haven't really done a lot of that, to be honest with you. I have a long history of not really liking the whole modeling industry. Yeah. So it's the the creative side of it that brought me back into doing it again or even trying it again. Yeah. Yeah, that's the way I think about it is, you know, because I think even if you look at, like, <clears throat> like in art history, like mm -hmm. what's the most famous painting? In my mind? Yeah. Um, Probably the Mona Lisa. Probably the Mona Lisa. Probably the Mona Lisa. And why is that? Why not? Because people see themselves in her? Do they want to know her because it's interesting? <clears throat> I think it's at least got something to do with her, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Like, I know it's, it's Da Vinci. Mm -hmm. 
But Da Vinci did all kinds of weird, interesting stuff mm. that could merit that type of attention. But something about the Mona Lisa. And so that's why I say I think that we haven't looked at models as the true creatives that they are, even in our history. Yeah, well, I mean, it wasn't there, but I certainly love art history. I hope that they were respected and represented and, and as participatory in the processes as we hope. But yeah, I mean, exactly. I hope, I hope. I think that the images come out better when the two people are also invested in the process and, you know, the final piece. And sometimes, for me, it's more like the process than even how the photos come out. You know, sometimes I just want to go, like, create a scene with my friends in the woods, you know, and it ends up being that way, so. Mm -hmm. Because I, exactly, and what you just said right there, to me, is that core of creativity that I'm interested in. And so, that everybody's to go does better work create, when they're creating together. Well, that, but also just this sort of joyful, innocent desire to go create a scene in the woods with my friends. Like, to me, that's what it all comes down to. Everything stems out of that initial simple desire to create yes yeah it's a creative outlet you're like we're gonna go and do this today or i need to do this today and it's like throw your bag full of <laughs> whatever the theme is and throw it in the car and head out exactly and yeah so there's something about that that gives us a uh an outlet uh, a means of expression like theater, like being on stage. And in fact, I was at the Paper Wing last weekend, community theater, and uh, a gentleman attending was just like, wow, I really want to do this, to be able to get up and just express yourself on stage. And I was like, go for it, buddy. Like, give it a shot. Yeah. But, you know, people, particularly now more than ever, I think, recognize the need, the absolute need for a creative outlet for mental and emotional well-being particularly over the last couple of years if that's not become more obvious that we need to tap into our creativity to heal and survive and uh, for be sure. better on the other side absolutely and <clears throat> we're at a i think we're at an interesting time with that too because it's like we have all these improved tools of creativity and yet i feel like so there is more possibility for us to do that than ever before. And I think it is happening a lot more than ever before, as evidenced by the amount of photographs that get published every day. Yes, and just the accessibility of it. I mean, now everybody has a camera, and everybody has filters, and everybody has you know, ways to prisma where you can turn it into a piece of fine art or whatever. So, I mean, yeah, it's, exactly. it's accessibility, but also to... How do you know what's good? How do you decipher between all the things that are being done? What were you going to say? I cut you off. I don't know. Flew out the window. How do I know what's good? I don't, I guess <coughs> I don't know what's good. I guess that's, it's objective. But that is what this last, I mean, two years has been about is just like s being seen or seeing people on those platforms because for a lot of people, that's all they had, mm. you know? So all of a sudden, like sharing in social media and all that stuff is blown up and it's not surprising. I mean, TikTok wasn't really a thing before COVID. Maybe it was a little thing, but now it's a big thing. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And then the idea of content creator and creatives and, um, has also changed and and grown like what is a an influencer you and know it's what a model is too what is a model yeah because i think because i think that uh there has been a period of time where there is an emerging field for creatives to be involved and so more people than ever have gotten involved and i think that every time that happens the resistance to that sort of shows itself in the form of, of like negative stigma of like, oh, well, you're just an Instagram model or this, you know, like mm. people who haven't received the benefits of actually doing it kind of try to belittle it so that they don't have to be vulnerable. But I think what is happening is so many people are getting involved in it and through that process of doing it, 
they realize that, oh no, doing the creative thing actually makes my life more fun. And that's why I do it. Yes, I mean, I hope that everyone continues to be creative. Um, and, you know, we can hope that just the last couple of years have been sort of like a value reset for people. Mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. I've, the, the photographers that I tend to work with are new emerging artists. They tend to be female, that's not strictly true. But, um, you know, just wanting to work with people who now are like, I don't want to go back to hustling at the bar and then do my photography on the side. I want to be doing my photography. Mm -hmm and not have to do the laborious side work or the, the extreme hustle that they were doing and then not giving their creative side the attention that they wanted or needed or deserved. So oh, I like helping that. to support, you know, them and their, their emergence, you know, is always good is for me. Um, and then sharing their work and hopefully that helps them get where they want to be next. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because for you, I think that's one of the the advantages that you have through participating as a model in creative projects is that you see, you, you both promote artistic projects and the arts, but you do them as well. So that gives you an inside perspective into all the time it does take, you know, mm -hmm. the value of the work that is the result of the process, you know, it means more if you really understand, like, what a person goes through, even just to have the courage to do it, you know, just to, to be vulnerable enough to attempt something you don't, every artistic moment is an experiment. You don't know yeah. if it's going to work. Right. And so that always takes a certain amount of courage. Yeah, I mean, I think sharing anything in this time and space takes a amount of courage because you are immediately going to be received, you know, or perceived or judged. So, y y yes, I think so. I mean, I've had my experiences with modeling as a child were unpleasant, you know, to mm -hmm. say the least, and it wasn't it wasn't like a creative space. It was like one year it's like you're underdeveloped and then the next year it's like you're overdeveloped. And then it was, you know, all of the body. opportunities that I yeah. had were just, you know, were strictly like body image, you know, fashion shoots. Right. Um, so that would be something that I would want to do again. And I can say that I did it, I did shoots with my photographer friends you know before COVID but it was during COVID that I did it more often because one I needed it I needed the the creative release I needed something to like mark the time that was passing and the things that were happening in my life but you could also do it fairly safely I mean you can do it from six feet apart mm -hmm. mostly we shot outside mm -hmm. even so it was in big studio spaces you know um so it was something that we could do that was, you know, safe. So my friends uh, did shots, like, through glass that were, like, really cool during the time. We just made it work uh, because we had to make it work. And you know, we had to continue to create. And lo and behold, now we're flush with money for social and emotional learning where they want kids to do art and, and thinking about the whole person. And it's like, yes, art and creativity is part of the whole person development and yes 100 percent. yes uh, yeah kids education arts education all that it's another topic no that's hopefully if we Back to continue portraiture and and uh, plays yeah no that, that's where it starts you know and but it's also that's where we're headed as a culture right like in doing uh, research about marketing you, you you have to learn about demographics you know and generations right generations are usually marked by these historic events and sort of how old you are in relation to them 
right? And so I can't figure out what generation I'm supposed to be. I've been I, you're Gen X. I don't know, man. Everybody, everybody has a different. Oh, you may be. You they cusp, know. You're, you're cusp of millennial. I know. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm not a millennial. No, but you are some, though. But you're like Gen X millennial. Right. But. Well, yeah, I know. But what? I don't want to be on that cusp. <laughs> you don't want to be on that cusp? I, well, it's always just weird. You see, like, so many different definitions of, like, what my generation was supposed to be. But being on the cusp, I suppose, is kind of, like, poorly defined. Yeah. As it is, where you're, like, there's yeah. so many connotations that come with both generations. And you're, like, well, I don't really fit in with either perfectly, you know? Like, yeah. I, you know, had a job at 12 and haven't stopped working since but at the same time I didn't have a cell phone until I was a senior in college so fortunately there's not a lot of photo evidence of my college years which I'm really grateful for but I also am not as interested or like on the edge of all the technology because it was not a part of my life until after like I was entering into career mode you know it became such a small thing that makes sense was it Friendster, right? No, and, and Friendster was one of the first ones out of college. The first, like, one that I remember. Seeking friends on an online platform. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, MySpace. MySpace. I didn't ever get into MySpace, but I've always been kind of resistant to technology platforms. You share yourself. Yeah, it's a... It's a huge part of what, I say that now. what's going on. Well, now I post something like all, every day. Yeah. So what changed? Yeah, what did change? So you're not an early adopter, we could say that. But no. And in general, I think I was raised to be fairly private, too. You know, like we were always just like, you know, you kept your business to yourself to keep your family, and we said soon as forgotten type of deal. So. See, okay, so that's an interesting take and an interesting point because a lot of times these generations are sort of marked by like their response to 9-11 their response to 2008 economic downturn but i think that what you're saying is even more important to the definition of the culture of that generation right is the technology mm. because agreed like there's <clears throat> i'm glad that a lot of what happened in high school isn't recorded for history. But if it were being recorded for history, you probably would do things differently. Not if we were the first ones, maybe not. No, but you know what I'm saying? It'd like, be a lot different now. Yes, exactly. So that now... If we were given that, I'm glad that we weren't the test subjects for that. Yeah. But, I mean, I also feel <clears throat> grateful that I was young when we got our first... PC, right? It was Oregon Trail and like mm -hmm. Carmen, San Diego, and everything was just like the up and down and left and right arrows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, I was in elementary school when I, you know, had the first floppy disks and everything. And so it's not foreign to me. I'm not separate exactly. from it. Exactly. Which. We're the bridge. Right. We're the bridge generation. Okay, I'll take that. I'd rather that than, I've, you know. Okay. Oh, we are. The bridge. Yeah. Okay. You're at the younger side of the bridge. I'm like right in the middle of the bridge. But yeah, because we know what it was like to not have constant connection, mm -hmm. to have more privacy, whether you wanted it or not. Well, and a lot of written connection. I mean, I remember writing, you know, letters and postcards and, you know, birthday cards and thank you cards and and that's definitely decreased with time, with the advent of email and DM and instant messaging. Yeah, it's a whole different thing now. I don't know if it's more or less because people the are content? just oh. doing it differently. Or even just the thinking about writing as an art form, you know, just well, the losing that. Like. The question is, where are people reading? And that's. Part Where are it. they reading? Where do you think they're reading? In the library. <laughs> are they? Not when it's closed due to COVID. No, I don't think... I don't know. So where have they been reading? I don't, I don't know. And that's why I am 
Asking the question. Asking the question. Well, where they're reading, I, one place I know they're reading is online. Well, yeah. Because that's, everybody's online. That's why blogs work so well as a marketing tool. Because there are people out there who are actively looking to learn about topics. Hmm. And that's why, as an artist, as a promoter, as a thinker, a blogger. as a blogger, as a podcaster, you have this tremendous ability. You know, the great upside of these tools is that we're potentially able to connect with the people who are interested in what we're doing. Connect if you're interested in what we're doing. Yeah, so, you know. What are we doing? We're talking about how to, how to, you, how to make the most out of the least, right? Like COVID. You mean how to use happiness as a business model? <laughs> if <laughs> happiness is a goal, yeah. which I think it's an important, an important thing, you know, happiness. It spreads. Being creative brings happiness. Being creative is one of the main ways for me to create happiness in my life. But you have to... When I was younger, I didn't understand that I needed a good business plan as well. And so I almost used creativity like a drug because I knew it could make me happy. So I would go to it, go to it, go to it. But it wasn't sustainable because I didn't have a plan for how I was going to bring money in for the time that I was putting out. And that ultimately what you need is you need that reciprocity between energy exerted and what you get back. Right. And that's, that's sustainable. That's sustainable and sustainable and profitable are kind of the same thing in terms of one a, would hope yeah. a business plan. Right? right. And so what you need if you really want to tap into and this circling back to what you were saying earlier, I feel like we have these new positions in life, these new career opportunities where our life actually is our content. Right. And so there doesn't have to be that separation between you and your creative work. You are your creative work, right? In the same way that as a model, the way you put yourself together, the way you prepare for a shoot, what you think about, what you dream about, what you do unconsciously that's going to draw something out of the photographer, all of that is the work of the art, right? Right. So now we just have more ways that you can monetize just your being, you know? And if you want to do creative work, that's a tremendous opportunity. So how do they make the happiness and the sustainability and the profitability all work together in okay. a happy little chunk? So that's a great question. So part of it is, I think, you, you have to tap in, for an artist, for anybody, you have to tap into the market, right? There has to be a way to get some exchange of value, right? And so you have to find who is interested in what you're doing. How do you do that? Well, you have to keep putting stuff out there. And hope someone just hits you up. No. There, I mean, there's a lot of different ways. How's that chair treating you? <coughs> Chair's just fine. <laughs> so I'm handling it. I'm handling it just fine. We can, we can get you a more comfortable chair. No, I'm good. I worked out this morning. That was actually why I was late. <laughs> I, had to, I had to shower. That was... But <laughs> to me, that is part of the way that you take care of yourself, what you do with your life, right, is going to be what sets you apart in this space. Do you think that people want to be set apart in the space or only if they're looking to monetize... Do they want to be set apart in the space? Like some people maybe join in on these social media platforms to be a part of it and don't necessarily want to be. But I guess those who want like a million, I guess my, my intention of joining 
social media was never to be like, I want to see how many likes I can get or how many followers I can get or whatever. Like my, you know, you always get those messages that are like, if you want to grow your Instagram, like post your shit here, right? All the time. Yeah, yeah. And scams. I'm like, I really Lots don't want to grow my Instagram internationally. You know, like that's not a goal of mine. My goal mm-hmm. is always just to spread stuff that's happening around here to the people around here at least who if not just around here people that care about the arts and what's happening in Monterey County um yes 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 okay so it's like two (laughs) different ideas of what you know like they're standing apart and then there's wanting to be part of the group and then there's monetizing it I mean it's how how do you if you want to monetize it find your market and well that's where I think that you it's not even about it's more about uh, if you want to have a sustainable business plan, you have to have a sustainable lifestyle. Like you have to be able to take care of yourself. You need self-discipline. You need mental outlets. It doesn't get any easier the older you get too. I mean, you really have to be. Yeah. Take, take, a, take your vitamins today. Uh, Not yet, but I I do. I take (laughs) vitamins. I I try to take care of myself. Get enough sleep. Try to get enough sleep. Work out. Work out. Eat good food. And those are the things that, you know, a lot of times are not taught to artists. Like, because I think you sort of have this idea that you're supposed to just be focused on that buzz that comes from creativity that's like the only thing you do well i'm gonna say that maybe that's taught to more than just artists right i mean that's the whole self health that we as a country haven't really cared about i mean our whole our whole school uh blueprint is based on like industrial revolution thinking Mm -hmm. where the way that grades and classes and age groups were separated and structured the standardized testing all of that stuff was to make good little laborers who could follow the rules and fill you know go into the factories and do the work and it isn't until just recently that it's the whole self education is being considered again in curriculum and maybe it has been I feel like I was really lucky to go to school where we had sex ed and and sociology and like classes you know for art and um, and that's that's not the norm so I don't know if it's just creatives that aren't taught to take care of themselves I think that we have been taught no, that you're right, you're our right. yeah. whole person is very low on the priority compared to output or compared to your um, position or your output into society. Like if you didn't graduate from high school and go into the work field and do your do-do-do, then you failed. You know, but we're talking 150, 200 years ago, and that's when this educational structure was being built. That was what was important. So, again, yes, is it important to creatives? Yes, but I think that it's important to everyone that to remember that, like, being creative and taking care of yourself and being happy is important. And, again, I think that COVID maybe just helped people remember that in a lot of ways where they weren't, like, they were just running on fumes all the time or running on, you know, coffee and nicotine and just like grinding it out and living on sustainable lifestyles for the output, right? Like right. it's always at the detriment of ourselves if we're productive or if we're exactly. successful or if we're making money. Yeah, it's doesn't matter if I got four hours of sleep right. and I'm living off. It's just results based. Right. Right. Because you are a successful part of society you're doing what you're supposed to do but you need to back it up and then you become a burden on society when your liver fails and you're on dialysis and you're you know need all this care because you drove yourself into the ground for a couple decades so no i think that's a really good point and i think that part of what maybe the lockdown showed us is 
when you have less access to happiness, to joy from things that are out there, mm. it, you know, forces you to sort of figure out what you need to do to make yourself happy in here. Like, and for me, it'll... But we also say that from a place of privilege, and I just want to acknowledge that I feel privileged to say that I had lots of outlets during that. During this time, we live in a beautiful place. The lockdown was difficult, but I know that for many people, they couldn't find that space. And so I just want to be like, you know, I know that I was given, we're given here in California, the lockdown was like, there's plenty that you could still do and see and be a part of outside. And I just feel particularly lucky, you know, because some, the creative space was like, the window was tiny, you know. No, 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 I mean, that's a great point. And it's always good to remember and to be grateful to participate in creativity at any level is is a great blessing because most of human life is work. It just it is. It's true. But most of the existence of human life is just hard labor, you know. And so it is a great privilege to be able to step into a space where you are being creative. Right. And you know, I think that it is true also though that once you do that you step out of in order that goes back to the whole question of are you setting yourself apart or are you fitting in Mm. what is that relationship with and as far as setting yourself apart it's about if you want to have a career in creativity you end up becoming in some way your own boss, right? It's, you have to learn how to do all of that, you know, your billing, your insurance, all the things that normal occupations would take care of all of that, and you just plug in your labor to the system. Mm-hmm. Now you're involved in the whole system, which is very challenging, but it gives you both, it gives you the understanding that You know, it's funny because once I started working with businesses, I started seeing from the business's point of view, most people who are just working won't understand that side of it until they've had some experience. But all you have to do is just take yourself seriously as an artist, as a creative, and all of a sudden you are in the business world. You're an entrepreneur, and you're going to see all the challenges that come with that. And so while it is a privilege, it's also a tremendous challenge. Right. It's a whole other set of skills to then become your own boss and to run the billing and the insurance and all of that side of it as well. Yes. Or they could just call you and you can do it for them. (laughs) No. (laughs) Or help them. No. And that's that's one thing that I definitely want to say is that if I can help people with anything, it's helping them to figure out how to figure it out for themselves. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, I run an agency where I create content and digital assets for brands and businesses, and that I sell to them as a service. Mm -hmm. While I am developing my own creative work as well, but, so I am, You know, you have to act. Once you take on that role, you have to learn about business from all the different sides, right? You need to think about the end user, the consumer. And so for an artist, I think it is incredibly valuable because ultimately you want there to be that flow of energy that comes and goes and that Mm -hmm. is sustainable and is profitable and so you have collectors collecting your work you have a place for your work to go so that the next show can go on right you can have little bursts of creativity in your life but if you want to have a sustained career you're going to have to figure out a way to keep it going and so i think for a lot of artists it's going to be working with brands is a place where you can 
use that creativity for somebody who needs that creativity and has a budget for it. And so I think that's really the first step for most creatives is becoming some sort of an agency, providing a service of marketing for other brands that then you also apply to your own work. But most artists are not going to be able to find their market fast enough to be sustainable out the gate. So you're gonna have to find other ways to. What about artists that aren't looking to make things for others, like marketing and brands, and just want to sell their fine art through? You know what I mean? Like their their content is fine art images. Mm -hmm. right? So they're not creating, or they're creating their own brand, but they're not creating stuff for other people necessarily. I think that that is, it's a very big challenge right now. And partly it has to do with the way we're experiencing art right now. How are we experiencing art right now? Not very much, I don't think. Really? Why? Well, because I think that people, their attention has shifted to the digital realm. Mm. I don't think that art has really figured out how to compete. How to com this. how to compete and how to tap into. Right? Which is why I think the move is to become an agency so that you can learn, right? You, all, all you need to do as a creative to add value is be better than the people who are doing it already. Right? To add value. To yes. add value. Sure. But so, then you need to market it and get people to buy it and confirm the value. Exactly. So you have to you have to start somewhere, but you can there are I guarantee there are businesses in your area out there if you're listening to this that mm -hmm. need help and you can find them and start helping them and then develop a track record of doing work that gets compensated and through doing that you know you'll start to read blogs like copy blogger which is i think a tremendous resource or hubspot you know things that where there's a whole team of marketers who've come together to formulate how this thing works mm -hmm. you know and you tap into that and you take some ideas from that and you bring them to your client and now they're operating at a higher level and we all can do that. You know, there's so many things to learn about how this industry works. Well, and it's still changing all the time. I mean, really. It is. Ever changing. Ever changing. Well, what about the people who are like, I'm super busy just trying to keep my head afloat. How do I dive headfirst into becoming an agency? Well, it's not for everyone. You know, I think you have to, you have to really want it for one thing. You've got to be able to make some sacrifices and you have to be willing to do the work, you know? I, I don't, it's certainly it's not an easy route. I wouldn't recommend it for people who aren't willing to work really hard. But if you want to succeed as an artist, I think that you can. And it's going to be a long path, but you can you can build your way up from whatever level you're at and all, all you have to do is keep working on your craft both you know if you're a photographer doing that if you're a writer doing that whatever your medium is stay invested in improving always improving and then you're going to be better than some of the businesses around you that need help. And so start getting paid for it, start seeing how that works. And then next thing you know, you, your own work is gonna start to get more traction. And you'll understand, you know, what you need to do for oh, yourself. But what do they need to just get to that place, right? They need a website, they need a social media presence, and they need a group of people that are following them. Collectors are helpful if they already have them. They're like, well, you know, okay. they need a blog. They need a podcast. Yes. 
What but do they need just to just to even think about becoming an agency? They okay. So everyone needs some sort of content pillar. Okay. Well, that's a nice one. Content pillar. Yeah. Can I trademark that or is it? No, no. This is not mine. <laughs> So content pillar is like something you're going to do consistently that's going to provide a much bigger context for your work. Now, okay, so let, let's let's get specific where we are here at the shop, right? Right. Because I'm constantly looking for art experiences, you know, and thankfully, as an artist, I can just create them. Mm -hmm. So I can all, as far as that goes, but I'm always also looking to be inspired by other artists, and I want art experiences. But I also have a business to run and I, so I can't just willy-nilly go do whatever, right? Right. And so, for example, you know, I wanted to see the show here, but it's only up for the weekend mm. and doesn't didn't fit into my schedule for me to make it down here. Mm. But so for me, <clears throat> that wasn't a great opportunity for an art experience. Now, what I would love to see, I think great, there, there's a lot of great things about that, that, you know, that even with only a three-day window, that sort of creates an urgency and, you know, maybe helps to turn out. And that's fun, and that mm. creates a buzz and interest around artwork, and that's all good. But as somebody who loves art, you know, I want to get deeper into what she was doing. Mm. You know, and that's ultimately where I think you, collectors are going to be thinking too is like not just like being wowed by work work can be impressive but to me it's more about being impressed by the person behind the work because you want to see what they're going to do long term mm. right so what I want to see is a follow up with her explaining certain things about C the pieces Sevilla. yeah with C. Her, Sevilla yeah Art, Art de Sevilla on Instagram. Yeah. You know, I, I would love to dig into a single piece with her. Mm. So, you, so you saw the show, so tell me about some of the work, and then let's talk about the piece that sold, maybe why that piece sold, or just what, what it was about. Well, the, the shop space is unique in that you come into the retail space, which is all lit up, and... There was music playing by our friend Joey outside. Um, so uh, you got your, your glass of McIntyre wine, you got your, your cone, your charcuterie cone by Little Luna Cheese Boards, which are, um, she, Little Luna Cheese Boards, runs out of the kitchen here at the shop, one of the many. Um, and then the exhibit is behind a door where it's the artist collaborative space. So most of the time, that is where the artists are creating in and out. There's, you know, spray paint flying and stuff. So during the show, it's closed, and instead it's hung with her artwork. And this was the Animal Kingdom. So it was a variety of animals with crowns and on their heads. And the, ones that's, the one that sold was a rather large elephant piece, um, which was really great but I the best part about it for me is that it was staggered time so you got to go in and you know see was there in the back room with just a small group of people and we could really talk and what was interesting is that she used to be a sculptor primarily mm -hmm. and then wasn't able to sculpt anymore and had to paint and we actually bonded over the fact that you know I used to be something else and then had an accident and had to change my life so I see where you're coming from and that the exhibit was great but it was really my connection with her of like oh we've both had these opportunities to like reinvent her ourselves um, whereas she was like I'm just a sculptor and then had to was forced to um, do painting and and I believe this is one of her first solo Exhibit, so it was exciting that I got to be there when they put the green dot up on the wall and it sold. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's awesome. But, but again, emerging artists. But then mm -hmm. that space during the rest of the week turns back into that the studio active. Space. Well, and right now there's a paint not perfection workshop. 
kids workshop in there right now and they're painting the kids are back there painting and, the and so that's just sort of the nature of this space is yeah. it's an active artist right. work it's not area. set aside gallery it's not space. just a gallery space but so even what you just said right there gave me more context to appreciate that work because of her personal journey and what she's gone through what that work then means right Right, like there's this famous book by John Berger called Ways of Seeing. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I haven't read it now. But he, he did it. At, he was a great writer. Uh, he was a novelist, but he wrote about art a lot as well. And he wrote this book called Ways of Seeing. I think it was BBC production. But there's this one moment in it where it, it basically talks about how the context of a work really, really changes the way you look at it, right? And so you s there's this page that shows it's a Van Gogh painting and it's a painting of a field of corn with some crows. You know, it's not the greatest Van Gogh that you've ever seen, but it's kind of a moody painting. Mm -hmm. And then you turn the page and then he lets you know this was Van Gogh's last painting. After he painted this, he went back, he was institutionalized. He went back and shot himself with a shotgun. Then you flip back and look at the painting, and you go, "Oh my God! I didn't even look at." He painted at it. when he was institutionalized. He did, though. Yeah. So, it was his last painting before he was institutionalized. But he continued to do still lifes while he was institutionalized. Well, he killed himself in the institution. Right. But so this was but his last. Okay. That was not my understanding of his last painting. Oh, well. I'm intrigued now. I'll look into it further. Yeah. But now your perspective has changed because you now see it through this lens of like, holy shit. Yes. This and even like, if maybe it's he knew he was gonna die, or maybe he knew this was his last painting, or maybe it, and you can read into it a million different ways now that you have some more context. Exactly. Which is why artists should do blogs and podcasts and have websites so people can get to know them and be more invested in it's the pieces that are produced. It's exactly like, yeah, what... Yeah, it came full circle. Yes. It's almost like we planned it. Yeah. So you, that's really? exactly it, is that you have to create the context of understanding for people to understand why the work is important to you, and then it could be important to them. I wish I knew someone who could help me build a website. You know, I, <laughs> and and it's, it's so interesting, though, because we're so focused, I think, sometimes... Well, artists are so focused on making things, but... Sharing things is equally important. Like, you can't yeah. make, if you make things and no one sees it, then how far does the impact go? And then also, you create problems for yourself if you don't sell the work so that you can re-up your product, you know, your supplies and everything. It's a business. Like, well, and then you create supply and demand, and then you have to be making things to keep to whet the appetite of those that are interested in your... Exactly. Work. Now, in a world with 7 billion people, surely there is demand for your work. Now, your job is to both get your work out there with the context where people will understand why it's important to you so that it could be important to them, right? Because maybe they have a similar thing that's happened in their life where they've had to adapt to a situation. And so they see what you've done with your adaptation as inspiring. Right. But if they don't know that you've adapted, and they or just... Or you see the previous work as invaluable, it, right? And it, now you look at, see sculpture, and if she's maybe not able to do that, like, at that level anymore, then that's now precious. That too. Artwork. Exactly. And it's, it's just all, you know, everyone, their life is a story, and the things that they make along the way are... But people don't like sharing about themselves, though. It's hard for people to get over that. Yeah. That it's worth un worthwhile enough that, you know, that it, that whether it's b bravery or whether it's, you know, belief that what they have is worthwhile, whether it's just staying on top of it, you know? I mean, so many people I know create a website and then just let it kind of, like, Oh, I haven't really done anything with it in a while. Exactly. You know, it sits on well, their checklist. of like, oh, I need to update that sometime. Because they haven't reached that point where the demand 
is there. But you have to do that first before you can get the demand. You do. And then you have to keep it up once you get the demand. To a certain extent. But as soon as you have enough demand... Have you reached that point? Yes. You have. What's the magic formula? I blogged for 100 days in a row. But I'd already been blogging for some period of time. But I, I found that buckling down and getting super consistent with it really elevated the work for me. And, the, you know, but also it's like certain things I did in my life that allowed me to even do that. Mm-hmm. Like uh, certain commitments to fitness that I made, which, you know, it's kind of, I've never, you know, I, I played basketball when I was in high school, but primarily I've always considered myself an artist, not an athlete. But fitness to me is one of the most important things I do because it gives me the discipline to stay on track with doing the work that creates the demand for the work. You know, it's like, it's like when you are working out, you have an appetite. You sleep well, you know? You, your life functions better. Yeah. It, it's the same thing with doing the work of marketing. It's an investment. It is. Just like doing the work of the marketing just in yourself. Exactly. And so working on the marketing as an artist is very similar to taking care of yourself physically. And so people need to just buckle down set uh, some goals exactly try to do it every single day yes and and set the goals to the point where because you are now a successful agency exactly if you 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 will become a successful agency if you start your goals small enough so that you can fulfill them you know and this is something that all right well i'm a photographer i'm up and coming for Okay. What is a goal? What is an easy, attainable goal to set for your, like, emergence? What's something you would set as a photographer? Okay, I would say figure out a, a project to work on as a photographer that has some sort of distinct theme. Okay? Does the theme have to be different than everybody else's? Is that because people now are like, it's no. be wild, it's what you need. No, it could be anything. Happy. Okay. But, so first of all... You know, I think if you are a photographer, you, you got, that could be so many things, right? That, that's the first thing you have to decide is what subcategory of photography do I want to learn more about, right? You know, because there's, there's portraiture, there's landscape photography, there's fine art photography, there's commercial photography, there's documentary photography, there's action photography, there's, you know, formal event photography. Okay. There's so many different ways to approach the world with the camera. So you got to figure out what are you good at, you know, and if, if you're the type of person who goes into the studio and gets distracted and, you know, starts listening to something and then trail off into something else and you can't get it done, that's not the place for you. Maybe better to go to an event mm. um, you know and it so it depends on first of all what you're good at what you can actually get done right I work well in a studio I love the studio environment so I can bring stuff into a studio no problem and stay my workflow will stay good um, you know but if that doesn't work for you maybe plan your calendar to say, I'm going to cover one event a week for the next three months, you know, and set your goal so it's achievable. And then by doing that, you know, so... You can present yourself as an event photographer. Yeah, you absolutely can. Then you can get a media pass to go to bigger events and you'll get backstage access to things you never believed was possible. When I was first starting out as a photographer in business, before I even had a marketing business, I lived across the street from the art director for O'Neill Wetsuits. And I actually went to South Africa and had full MVP, or MVP, VIP access 
to the backstage of the the professional world tour setup in J Bay. You know, I was like sitting next to Marcus Sanders of Surfline and you know, Kelly Slayer would like go grab a sandwich right in front of me. And it was only be all I had was a blog. At that time. At that time. All I had was a blog and I just presented it to the World Surf League and they gave me a pass. So all you have to do is get started. But so back to that plan for that photographer, right? Cover one event a week for three months. So you're going to then cover 12 different events. You're gonna meet in that process, you're gonna meet 50 different people who have different projects they're working on. They're gonna see you now as a photographer. They're gonna see the work. They're gonna to link to the blog. Now you've created a context for yourself as an event photographer. So the first thing you have to do is just figure out what you're good at and then create the assignments for yourself to do. And then a place for people to reference them. And a place for them to go. When so, you're out there meeting those people and now yes. everybody just grabs your handle and then you're in. Yeah, it's easy enough with social media to make those connections. And then if you have a blog where they can so go. It's not too late, you know, start uploading your, your stuff now. No, it's never too late. You can start any time and just start building. But the thing that you want to do is you want to set yourself, like you said, goals that you can achieve. Because that's what people are also going to want to see is that you can actually deliver, you know. I mean, everyone can talk. Well, there's that clout farming, right? And there's those yeah. engagement pods, too, is that if you start working with these groups more and more, then you start liking each other's stuff and sharing each other's stuff and following each other's connections and colleagues, you know, and it spreads, spreads out. Exactly. And then you find cool people you can collaborate with and... And other event photographers that you can follow their stuff and, and improve upon your own craft and yeah. see what other people are doing and yeah. Exactly. And so well, it's what about right now? It's just you just want to stick your head in the ground and be like, This this too shall pass and life everything's gonna go back to normal and I'm not ready. Well that's fine too, you know. I don't I'm not I'm not suggesting anyone needs to do anything. Whatever is gonna take care of yourself the best is gonna be the best. Whatever brings you happiness sustainability and profitability exactly it's now a I, trifecta i don't think that usually sticking your head in the sand isn't going to bring you any of those things <laughs> so that's not usually the well you know just uh, there's different levels of not embracing you know there's there's i guess could you do you have to be all in can you do just some or all i mean i personally it seems overwhelming to be like okay a website and a blog in a podcast and then, you know, no, managing no, no. social yeah. media. Like, that seems like a lot, especially yeah. for people who are just like, damn, I just wanted to be an artist. And now I have to, like, put myself out there on six plus different platforms. Yeah. No, I get that. And it's, that's why it's not for everyone. And I actually, I run into this a lot with musicians. This is funny because musicians seem to be more purists about this than other people, at least in my experience because they feel like they should just be able to do the music and that the marketing is business and that's separate. Mm. But I, I 1 million percent don't believe that that's true. And I think that- I think all art can be tailored to- I think that any- Those that are wanting- Can be and should be if you care about your career. It's just about if you have the ability- You gotta make some people happy if you're gonna be successful. Yes, you do. <laughs> Somebody's gotta enjoy it. <laughs> And, but if you do have control over your career, you have ownership of your work. You know, what we've dealt with so long is in, in having creatives feel like, oh, there's a separation between business and creativity. I'm just the creative. Let them do the business. And then right. you get ripped off every the single agent, time. They're the selling gallery. They're the, yeah. Yeah. There's their percentage. And so, so then artists are perpetually getting screwed and then they're always going to be unhappy, and it's a bad business model. Yeah, and then they're going to have to turn to many other jobs that will distract from their creative 
content. But so that's why I say if you take the idea of advertising, of marketing, and you see it as a creative challenge and a joy, and instead of it being like, oh, I got to do business, you go, what can I do that's going to be the most entertaining, the most fun, the most. So they shouldn't look at it like sales. Mm-mm. Because they should still be happy with what they're doing or creating. Yes, and it's not, they're not good at sales. So it, it, I don't even, what they should be working on is marketing, and marketing is culture. So they have to be cultural. Yeah, so they, 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 have to share they gotta create a culture. Around their work. Around their work. And around themselves. And around themselves, exactly. So that we care about who they are. And then, you know, it's the same with brands. It's like, when we care about, you know, uh, who's behind brand, and you get a sense of, like, Ben and Jerry's, incredibly successful brand, right? And it's partly it's because people have this affinity for those little bald Vermont dudes, right? They're so great. They're just charming, lovely guys, and yeah. so... But they do good work, and they, yeah, they're creative. Incredibly creative. <laughs> I mean, they've done stuff with ice cream that people would never have believed. Oh, you know? and they created a whole lane, right? Right. I mean, now that you look in the store, you see there's a lot going and on. And their size, they're a little, like, you know. Innovators. Mm-hmm. Legends in the game. And that's what I'm... But not afraid to share their perspectives and... and possibly, you know, insult or antagonize the people that don't share in their similar, you know, they're very clear cut about like their beliefs and their ideals and what they respect. And, uh, and they put it out there in their marketing because now I guess they're successful enough that they can, or maybe they always have, I don't recall that far back, but, um, you know, they've gotten to a place where they can, they got enough they clout. can make that delineation yeah. between like, what they what they want to really back yeah you know, they don't have to be as ambiguous when you're trying to just figure out what you're where you click where you click who you who's interested relate in you. to yeah and but i think that's that's the goal and that's where okay part of what one of the cash phrases that comes up a lot in marketing is authenticity right mm. and i that's because i feel like we have such a disbelief in general about people. I agree. Right? We're very skeptical. Yes. I actually, that's something I think that I feel that I get from social media is that like people think that there's like a disingenuous nature behind it. You know, or like there's something behind my post or like you're getting paid or there's something, there's got to be some kind of there's catch. Yeah, there's some right? fix. Yeah. So, exactly. I mean, human nature or, or cultural, you know, current cultural, whatever, whatever. But no, we're not a very trusting people, which is weird because we're telling them to do exactly the opposite and like put yourself out there to find people who are interested in you. And you find plenty of people who aren't. Oh, Maybe yeah. you'll find people that aren't very nice and who wants to do that? But, but to, so, in other words, though, we're starting out in this climate of disbelief, right? So in order to get people to buy into any sort of pro, pro, program you have, they have to, at some point, believe you. And so that's why I think flaws are actually good, right? Mm. Because being perfect is impossible, and so it's always only... <laughs> It's always only, you know, the editing that, you know, that we do. But so having flaws, being human is part of what makes us real. Well, it brings connectivity, you know. Yeah. For people that are looking for that. Not all art buyers are looking for connectivity, you know. But, but the ones that we can reach, particularly in our local surroundings, more li- likely are. You know, if you, if you reach a certain level of success and people want something of yours because they think you're up and coming 
or they think it's going to be valuable, then then they don't really care about maybe necessarily who you are as a person because what they're getting from you has value. That's or right. It, it's more of they, an investment right. kind of a thing. But a lot of people, most people don't buy art as an investment in that way. You know, most people buy art that they love and then it happens to be a good investment as well. I'd say I know both. Okay. I know art investors. Yeah. Who do it because they love it, but they also do it. They're primor- primarily doing it because it will be a good investment that they enjoy looking at. Yeah. Right. But, but it just depends on how their minds, you know, are, I think, too. I think creative minds look at it and see maybe necessarily one value first. And the other minds, the accounting minds will be like, that's going to appreciate and, and I enjoy it. Yes, yes. Well, anytime we get connected to the larger art market, too, that's all. there's always a higher level of investment involved in that. And But the question is why, and I think that the answer has a lot to do with people don't know what's good. They don't know what to invest in. They don't know what they really believe. I feel like we're in a weird place. Well, how do we, how do we make that? How do we change that? <clears throat> how do we how do we figure that out and then and then direct artists to be able to figure it out it's it's got to come from <clears throat> it's got to come from the work has to connect right the work has to connect ah okay so you're saying the work maybe isn't like the highest like a, a Mona Lisa but they've connected on a personal level with the artists, and that way it has more meaning, or is meaningful. Well, okay. <clears throat> Usually there's three ways that art can create meaning. We're about to learn something here. Yep. Write it down. Yep, 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 three yep. Okay. ways. This is important. That this art important. can create meaning. There are three ways that art creates meaning, which is how it also creates value, Okay. It either can be something intrinsically interesting about the artwork itself. Okay, so you don't have to know anything about the artist. You don't have to know anything about anything except you see it and you go, interesting. There's something there. Yeah. Or you can get the value from the artist, right? So an artist like Picasso creates a plate and signs it, and that thing is immediately valuable, right? Right. Because, because of the artist's fame, their notoriety, you know, and that's partly why the Mona Lisa is mm-hmm. because it's a Da Vinci, right? Right. Now, the third thing is the setting, the context, the, institu- the institution that shows the work, right? So the Mona Lisa being at one of the world's most famous art institutions, people already go there expecting to see art of the highest caliber. So they have that in their mindset then they already expect Da Vinci to be one of the greatest artists of all time. So they have that in their mind. So now... I mean, it's not the greatest painting that you've ever seen of a woman in your mind. And that's ever. why it's such an interesting thing. Because like, why is it so? Because the value isn't intrinsic in the artwork. It's the other two pillars mm. of meaning that are making it the most valuable work, you know? But so those are the three things that create meaning and value in art. And so that's why as artists, usually, usually the path has been to go through these institutions that have art historical importance because that automatically sort of increases the value. Right. Right? If you show it the Whitney, if you show it the MoMA, your work's going to have a higher price tag. But the other two angles, you know, that's the one... That is the traditional way to get success as an artist, and it is the one that you have the least control over, right? It's a curator, it's an art director. Right, and there's always a, a fee or a, you know, a cost that's never, yes. There's politics. Yes, there's, there's always politics. It's the least under the artist's control. Yes. But you have total control over the other two. Right? Who you are, your reputation as an artist, your biography, how you present yourself to the world, and the work. Those are the two things that an artist can control. 
And so the goal is ultimately you want to have all three, right? So you want to be an artist who has a reputation for making great art that people want to see. So they care about you, they care about the work, and now you're going to put it in a place where people go to see art that they care about, mm. right? Traditionally. Traditionally. And, and, but, and part of the reason is because there's almost no other space where art is the only focus. The, the experience of art is the only focus. Usually we see art in public, traffic and people. We see art in a coffee shop, commerce happening, but a, a gallery or a museum is the only place where we go and do nothing but look at the art. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it does matter, but for an upcoming artist, if you don't have access to that, you have these other two pillars to work on, right? And circling back real quick to when you were talking about your own journey in social media and not wanting to necessarily be a worldwide phenomenon, right? There's this great essay I forget who the author is right now, but it's called A Thousand True Followers. A Thousand True Fans. Okay. okay. All right? And so we get caught up in chasing numbers sometimes, right? I need a million followers. Ah, how are my numbers doing, right? I have, I have no idea, actually. But I do know that some people can pull it up as part of any conversation. You know, I have such and such many followers and such and such many likes, but... It's, yes, it's for some of, people it's an, an important target or something that they aspire to. It's part of how people try to figure out what is good. So tell me about the essay. So the thing is, if, you, if you've got a million followers on Instagram and nobody's buying any of your stuff, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Right? But if you've got a thousand people who are invested in your project, and they all contribute, uh, they buy $100 worth of product mm -hmm. through the year. Well, they're all collectors. They're all in part and parts of, I mean, the whole the collector's list and cultivating collectors is a whole other ballgame. I mean, once you have these people roped in, you have to cultivate, even if they're $100. I mean, $100 sounds like very little compared yeah. to some art yeah. price tags. It is. Um, but, but keeping them, like sending them special emails or holiday cards or invitations, you know, invitations um, that is almost as important as anything else that you're saying because if you have true collectors or a thousand true fans, I don't know if you have a thousand collectors, that would be pretty amazing, yeah. but um, then you can sell half of your stuff before you even go live. If you, you know, you have those people that believe in you and, and know you and you keep up with them and they have, they feel they have a relationship with you, even if it's as an artist and a collector, yes. there is still a valuable relationship that's formed and that's more important than, yeah, having a, a million people who are strangers and totally in. don't care. Yeah. Exactly. And because actually the, the relationship between the artist and the model, I think, is way underrated because I think the model has so much more to do with the creative process than we've ever given them credit for. But I also think that the collector has a big role in it as mm -hmm. well. And that for art to exist, there has to be a market for it. And so that actually, you know, I, I understand the idea of I just want to make the art that I make and if people like it or don't. But if you can engage with collectors, sometimes you know, oftentimes they're interesting people. Yeah. They care about art for their own reasons, and through getting to know them, you might get inspired. You know, you, hmm. and so just like you were saying that you resonate with C's work because she's made an adaptation, right? Right. We had a conversation where we acknowledged that we both had this similar path of, you know, reimagining our ourselves, you know, and what we thought we were going to be. And so that is, as a, a collector, it, be, being a collector is just being the ultimate fan of work, right? Right. 
Well, and now you know she's just beginning as a painter. And yeah. She's already fantastic. Yeah. So if you're like, oh, this is a new avenue for you, you can also say, well, I'm going to buy your stuff now because you're going to be great. Yeah. You know, so you can also I don't know, get in on the ground floor is kind of like a raw way of saying it. But when you meet people who have a lot of potential and you follow them and you continue to support them, then, I mean, it could end up being an, an investment that pays off when, if and when. I mean, at the very least, you like the work that you've bought, you know, and you've been, you put it up and you enjoy it in your home. But even better when, if and when, it gets recognized when someone comes over. Oh, you have one of those? Exactly. A hundred percent. And so then, that's what I'm saying. The story of art is always bigger than the artist, right? Because so even just as a fan, maybe you have sparked something in C, right? Where she's like, oh, I didn't even realize people who have adaptations will relate to this. Mm -hmm. So maybe that opens up new material. Right. You know what I'm saying? But so then also you'll be invested in seeing what she does next. Right. Well, and as things people as things reopen, you also want people to attend, right? And you mm -hmm. want there to be a drive and you know, now that galleries are open, it's it's a part of the equation again. Um, but you also want to have those people that you can count on to to come and buy the tickets and and bring the interest and and now share the flyers and the posts and the snippets and and get more interest and exactly because that's what creates the career right and so when somebody becomes a collector they're actually they are an investor right right because they they own part of that body of work and in some way they're saying I believe in you. I want to see you keep going. I want to see what right. you do next. Right. And so that's the kind of relationship that you have to cultivate as an artist. You know, and it's the same kind of philosophy that any brand needs to do also, except brands are dealing usually with such a lower price point. It's much less of a commitment to join a relationship with the brand. So what about, what about artists right now who are like, I need to create a brand? How do I create my own brand? So start with <clears throat> something that you're going to own, okay? And so that could be... Identify as your... What do you mean by own? Like... Meaning that... Like an avenue of creativity that you're going to dive into and have it be like... No, I mean more like a platform that you have control over, right? Okay. So um, that could be old school. It could be... You do a zine and you publish something weekly and you're doing it as, at FedEx and you're putting out a 10 page zine. Yeah, no, I get it. Right? I remember those days. Or what would make more sense probably is a blog. But not, not social media is the main thing because social media isn't a platform that you can own. Hmm. You you don't even really own a website, right? Because you could potentially get kicked off of a website, but the chances of that happening are s almost zero. So, but it's just like if you own a property and then there's a war and then now your country is no more, you don't own that property anymore, right? So the ownership is always contingent. Right. But the best chance you have of actually being able to control the content that you put up for yourself is to have a website with a blog. Um, and that is your farm. That is your farm where you produce the things and that's where people can go straight to the source. Right. And then the social media platforms and the e-newsletters or all those other things are the farmer's markets exactly. where you do outreach, yep. but it's not the core of what your your production is. Exactly. It directs those things, direct them back to. Yep. And that's where you will, if you do that, the first shift you'll have is you, 
the timeline of social media is so frenetic. It's so constant. It's so short lived mm. that you, in creating for that space, it's hard to even have a complete thought. You know, there's fragments. There's I don't think people want complete thoughts. But they do. In not on Instagram. Not on social media, <laughs> and which is why it's not the right place to present the larger context of who you are. But you can do it if you have in mind that that is what's to be done. But so what I'm saying is if you design for your website, like this to me is, would be a great content creation schedule for a young artist, okay? Do one blog a week that has four photographs and maybe three paragraphs, okay? And then, in but figure out what you're going to write about, what you're going to create the blog about. It can be about your artwork. It can be about something you're working on. And have that all figured out before you start. And then create some video during the process so you can do a reel. And then, but write your blog post and then do, just copy and paste from your blog and put that on your social media. And use social media just as the place where you put your goods, but not the place where you create your goods. And it just shifts the mindset Mm -hmm. so that you're not, so you have more complete thoughts. So you go, I am C. Sevilla. I'm at this point in my life. This is a series that I have, you know, a complete thought that allows people to enter in and see what's going on and relate to the whole person. I think, yeah, I think that's, that's a great place for people to start. And you can do that, you know, without too much of a time commitment. You can, you can and you can be your own boss of that platform, which can help you in your happiness. <laughs> Absolutely. And you can put up things there that are not appropriate for Instagram. Right, like <clears throat> a lot of the marketing that I've done, I've worked with a lot of cannabis companies, and it's very difficult to do cannabis marketing on social media. They don't allow it. At all. Well, they shut you down. Oh. But so what you have to do is you have to figure out the difference between lifestyle and blatant salesmanship. Mm. All right, and so. I've had to learn how to use social media when social media, it doesn't really work. You know what I'm saying? But so as a result, it's like. It doesn't matter. You're only reaching like 6% of your followers anyways, right? I know, but so. It's all rigged anyway. This is the thing, and I would say this to all cannabis companies is if you're getting shut down on Instagram, you're doing it wrong. What you need to be doing is you need to be putting up really fun stuff that will get you shut down. 100% guaranteed Instagram won't go for it. Put that on your website. And then on Instagram, let people know Right. that shit's on your website. Right. It's more of a lifestyle photo on Instagram. Yes. On Instagram. Where it's just a part of the bigger picture. Don't show it all on Instagram. Well, and that, I think, should just be the defining factor, the defining phrase of today. Yeah. Don't leave it all out there on Instagram. Don't leave it all on Instagram. Use social media to market your stuff, but have a home for your stuff, and then you're going to get more traction, and you'll just have more uh, mental clarity about the whole process, which will give you more sanity. It'll give you more ability to put things in their proper perspective, and... Be sustainable. I, I think that it's good to have people just write out a plan. At least when people have asked me about marketing, you know, I'm like, just give yourself the time each day to, because you can't also just post, mm-hmm. right? In order to create the pod, you have to go and you have to like posts, you mm-hmm. have to comment on things. 
Um, like, comment, and share will is what you want to boost your, exactly. your rating. Don't forget to do that to the pod. Like, comment, share, subscribe, um, all that good stuff. But, yeah, so you have to, like, you have to schedule it, and then you have to stick to it, and then you have to not feel bad about it. So, like, mm. I have mm. to commit. It's hard for me to sit still. I'm the type of person that is, feels bad when I'm like, oh, I just sat down and wasted, like, 45 minutes. So if you're like, I'm going to spend a half an hour on social media just liking, commenting, sharing, posting, then you've you've given yourself the okay to do it, but you've also put it into your schedule as a necessary part of your marketing your marketing process, right? Like you're saying one reel, you got to do one reel a week. You got to do one, you got to do video, right? No, everybody's doing video now. You can't just do static posts, all right? Mm -hmm. With the the advent of TikTok, it's like they want more video, more reels, more quick, fast. But again, that's the attention span and why you need to direct them, direct them back to something that's a little more substantial. Exactly. Well, and because... It comes back to a growing awareness of what social media consumption does to us as well, right? That we, it's one of the most distractible media we've ever encountered. Yes. But now I feel like all other media is just like racing to catch up. And now everything's just distracting. But, okay, so this was where when I started to really study podcasting, part of it was... I was so mystified by the fact that people would listen for three hours right. to a podcast in this culture where apparently we've only got 15 seconds for anything. Hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? Thank you for continuing to listen to this podcast. Exactly. <laughs> and we're not going to go for three hours because mom's got shit to do. But. but if we did, there may be people who would actually listen to the whole thing. And part of that, I think, is a fatigue of... The shallow, the little, the flicker, the... Oh, you think so highly of human beings. Well, if the numbers, they're the results. You know, it's like Joe Rogan could get a $100 million contract because people are listening to all three hours. Yeah. Oh. Well, yes. I do I do agree. I'm not going to hate on people that, that there are large groups of people who now use the internet in the way it should be used and are always listening and watching and trying to learn more and you know something comes up it's oh tell me more about this tell me more about that so I'm not going to totally hate on people in this podcast well you know I mean (laughs) hate away but (laughs) the point being that there is an appetite and so Going back to... For words. For meaning. For information. Exactly. For meaning. For connection. So going back to what you were saying real quick about video, right? Mm -hmm. There's the logic of why that is happening, we should think about, right? Mm -hmm. So first of all, TikTok is more oriented towards youth, Mm. right? And so Instagram and trying to compete with TikTok is both pushing the video and pushing youthful content. Mm -hmm. But as adults, we don't necessarily think that social media is where kids should be spending their time. Right. So why are we all following this plan, which is geared towards youth being on social media? Youth addiction to social media. So quite the contrary, I think, as practitioners in the field, we should be actively resisting that. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? Because if that's what Instagram is trying to do to keep you on Instagram, I love Instagram for the fact that it gives us connection to people. But I'm not just following along with Instagram's plans. Mm. Quite the contrary. I want to use Instagram to get them to my website where they're going to learn something or experience something. Mm. Right? So. I learned a lot about you on your website. Good. (laughs) I'm glad. That's why we're here doing this podcast. Exactly. And, you know, so it's like, how do we use the thing without letting it use us? 
and that's not it's impossible but if we have that as a goal then we can make it a sustainable process a profitable process a happy process but um so that i think is a good place to leave it today by the way folks this was uh e and j branding <laughs> did we forget to say that at the beginning we didn't introduce it <laughs> we just got going <laughs> And I am Jake J. Thomas, and this is Aaron E. Aaron Lyman, and uh, it's been a pleasure chatting here at the podcast room at the Shop Monterey with our lovely uh, studio tech. Joey's been out there running it for us, and uh, love Joey. Love Joey. We need some. We need some like a dedicated intro music and maybe some fun sound effects yeah know. we're gonna we're gonna work on that we got because we, we gotta remember to introduce ourselves at the beginning <laughs> yes 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 we're gonna get some drops we're gonna spice this thing up right now we're just figuring out the the bare bones the blueprint where we're gonna go it's morning it's a holiday thank you for sticking with us and and you know we're building and yeah. part, part of the whole idea of this is that you know, so there's some media where you got to get bigger and more spectacular, but we're going to just grow in depth. The more that we get to know each other, we know each other's projects, the more you're going to get to know us. So it's sort of your way of getting to know us through us getting to know each other. Do I need a website now? Yeah, you need a website. <laughs> and yes, and a blog. But only, you know, if it works for you. Yeah. Because the podcast, you know, it is a form of intellectual property that you own. And so that might be enough. You know, you might be able to... I'm not saying everyone needs a podcast, but you need something that isn't just social media. Right. If you want to grow your creative business. If you... I, yeah, if you want to have a sustainable, profitable business. Which will bring you happiness. And yeah. With the right amount you, of rest and exercise. Yeah, if you figure that all out, and then you'll bring happiness to your life and to other people's lives. And that's not what it's all about. That's what we're here for. So. Anything we can do to help. Till next time. Let's see. I can do big peach trees. We, we've we got a little... I know. I know a little something about it something, now. Something, something. Indica, Bigs, Pete, Big Pete's Treats. You're like, girl, you gotta say it right if you're gonna promote it. Is one of the sponsors of today's podcast. And uh, our friend Jacob works with them. And uh, you can check out their marketing and, and see what they're doing to see what you're doing. That's right. And these are some delicious cookies right here because they do the old school uh, butter style which is all I ever knew. I mean, is that old school? Yeah. Yeah. It's like what we used to do. Yeah. You, you cook the, the marijuana down in butter, and it tastes delicious. It makes for a damn good cookie. And mm -hmm. this one is actually vegan-friendly, gluten-free, dairy-free, all natural, 10 milligrams per cookie, so you can, you know, pace yourself. Or, you know, just eat the whole 100-milligram bag. That's and right. you'll sleep like a baby. I've heard. Yes. From Very a good. reputable source. Very good for bedtime. Big um, Pete's trees. Thanks, Big Pete. Yes. For another week of believing in us. And we also have here Caring Kind, this wonderful cannabis brand based in Santa Cruz. And they are just releasing their sun grown. So it smells delicious and it looks amazing. It's beautiful, crystally. Another cool thing that Caring Kind is doing, and this was actually why I first tried their product, which then led me to photograph it. Okay, so this is another way to proceed as a marketer, is try to, try to work with the things that you really like. So I found not too many people who put out good ounces or half ounces. And I saw this really nice looking caring kind ounce mm -hmm. that that was the way we used to get weed is you get it clean green certified hand trimmed packaged fresh 
you know, half ounce, get an ounce, and then you had a pack, you know, that you had for a little while. And it comes in this really easy pinch, pinch top, she said. Exactly. Keeps it fresh. It smells amazing. So it's once I saw... improved the aroma in the room while we've been sitting here. Once I saw the product that I really liked, I, you know, started to photograph it, and then I started to work with them. But so it just started out with a genuine interest in the brand, in the product, and then I created content with it, and then created a relationship with the owners. And now so I'm, you can better represent them. Now I'm working with the brand. So that's all it takes is it just d through your creative process, you know, it's like as a photographer, I've worked on product photography over the years. And so the challenge of photographing cannabis well is something that I've I've grown to love. And then as a result, I'm able to help out growers who want photographs of their crop. Or photographers who are looking to photograph cannabis. Exactly. So there's there's all these synchronicities out there that's just waiting to happen. You know, there's people who need your services and you need their business. So that's what it's all about. And uh, Karen Kine's new Sun Grown, check them out. Big Pete's Strawberry Vegan Coconut Cookies. cookies. Indica. So till next time, we're gonna get some nice music here. We might even tell you more about what this room was previously used for. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get into it. I love it. All right. Thanks, guys. Until Have a great time. week. See you next time. E and J Branding. Peace. Good job. You too.